This morning we have two stories out of the Gospel of Mark that seem to be disconnected but are really very, very, very connected. We have a story here at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus, or the beginning of chapter 6, where Jesus goes back to his hometown, right? And he does what he normally does. On the Sabbath, he goes into the temple and he starts to teach. Or he teaches on the streets. But he starts to teach, and in his hometown, they're like, Don't we know this guy? Have you ever experienced a person that you knew, and they said something completely different than you thought that they would say? And, and our reactions normally are, well, this can't be true, right? Because I know this person. This can't, this can't be happening this way because I know who they are. I know where they came from. I know what they've done. I know, I know all about them, right? And we obviously know everything about every other person that we've ever met in our lifetime. We are the final authority on, on their lives, right? Right? No, we're not. Not at all. Jesus goes to his hometown and he starts to proclaim like he's been proclaiming in every other place. But they said, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and on and on? And his sisters, did you realize Jesus had such a big family? Right? In Mark chapter 6, he's got four brothers and sisters and a mother. Who's left out of this list of people that Jesus comes from? Joseph. Is that coincidence? Or is that the crowd saying, we know who this kid is. Right? This is the one that they said isn't actually the, the offspring of Joseph, but everything's okay. Right? Is this the crowd saying that Jesus is illegitimate by not mentioning the Father's name? Poking more at the fact that he shouldn't be saying the things that he's saying. Poking more at the fact that he shouldn't be doing the things that he's doing. Right? It's, it's not a simple, we just left Joseph out. It's probably much deeper than that. So Jesus in his hometown says, okay, I can't believe these people don't really get this. You know, I grew up with them. They think they know who I am. But it's just not happening. So he does what? He cures a couple people. He does what he can. He still tries to give them the message of love. But then, because of everything that's happening, he leaves that place and goes out into the villages and he says, it's time for the 12 of you to not be following me anymore, but to do what you need to be doing, right? How many of us expected the fact that being a disciple of Christ means we not only have to follow Jesus and learn from him, but then at some point we have to actually do what he tells us to, which is to take up our cross and to go out into the world and deliver the message of, that he's been giving to us, to everyone else. He gives the authority to the disciples to go out into the world. And as I told the the children up here, right? He says, take a staff and one tunic. Actually, I'm overdressed compared to what he says um, because this is an outer tunic and my inner tunic, all this other stuff underneath of me is, is the overdressed part, right? You should have one set of clothes and that's it. Not a spare. And sandals. Take no money, take no bag, take nothing with you, but rely on the hospitality of those who you come in contact with. Now think about that for just a minute. What just happened to Jesus? in his hometown. Were they very hospitable to him? Not at all. And now he's telling the disciples to go out into the world and live on the hospitality of those who you come in contact with. It's kind of like a catch-22, isn't it? His hometown wasn't even welcoming to Jesus. But now Jesus is sending out his disciples into the world and tells them to rely on the hospitality so if you come into a place and they welcome you, stay there until you leave that place. Don't be hopping around everybody's house. Don't go visit other people. It's, you can go out and talk to them, but remain where you stay. And if someone doesn't accept you, shake the dust off your feet. What does that mean? Don't even take the dust from their town with you when you go. Leave everything there, because if they're not welcoming you, don't take anything from them. Right? Not even the dust. So go into the world, and they went, and here's the interesting verse in this. They went, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. 
So they went out, the twelve of them, went out and proclaimed that all should repent. How many of you have seen this before? The, the sidewalk preacher or the corner preacher with the sign, turn or you're going to burn? Right? Repent? Have you heard anybody tell you that you need to repent? That if you don't change your ways, that God's going to banish you into hell? Have you heard that? Am I the only person who's heard that? I've heard that. I still hear that from people on Facebook that they think that I'm a loony and, and not really actually following God. But that's interesting. So that's, that's in the here Because we've all heard these stories from people who say these things. And you can actually probably picture, right? These two disciples walking side by side, walking down the street, yelling, Repent! Repent! Right? Can you, can you see it? You can see it? What would you say if I told you that that's not exactly what that verse says? I'm not, don't, don't by any stretch of the imagination say that I'm not saying we should repent because we need to repent. Every last one of us is a sinner. Me being chief of them. I'll take Paul's line from him. That's fine. I'll argue with Paul when we get, to, get up there for that final banquet about who is a bigger sinner. Um, I think it will be an interesting conversation. But we're all sinners and we all need to repent. Don't get me wrong that we don't need to repent, but that's not what this verse says. Because this verse gives us that picture of the disciples going out and down into the towns and saying, repent, turn from what you're doing or you're going to burn. Right? That's what we get from this. What would you say if I told you that it should actually read? Let me get this so I get this correct. So they went out and proclaimed in order that or so that. The disciples went out and preached or proclaimed so that they might repent. See, this is a little interesting thing here in the Greek called a hina clause. Ina, I-V-A, is pronounced ina in Greek, or hina, because it has a breath mark in front of it. And this hina is a word that means in order that, or so that. And the verse actually reads, they went out proclaiming in order that they might repent. The disciples went out to tell the crowds and the cities and the people that they came in contact with everything that had happened. They didn't go out screaming repent. They didn't go out saying all of you need to repent. They went out telling the stories that Jesus had told them. They went out telling the things that they had seen Jesus doing. They went out telling the love that Christ had given to them. So that they might repent. Which is an interesting thing there, because who is the they in the they might repent? Who is that? Is that us? Is that the crowds in the communities the disciples come in contact with? Is it the disciples? Jesus sent these 12 men out into the world, telling them to take nothing, to just be dependent upon the hospitality of those that they come in contact with, giving them a message of hope and love that no one had seen before, telling them to go out, and he even gave them authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And it says in verse 13 that they did that, that they cast out demons, and they anointed people and they healed the sick. Because Jesus in another place in the Scriptures tells us that if we believe and follow him, that we will do greater things than he did. And the reason that we do these things is not to make people look at us, but so that they can hear the stories and they can know how much God loves them so that they might repent. We're sent, just like these twelve. So go home and tell everything that you got by a staff, one tunic, and a pair of sandals. I'm kidding. You were worried for a moment. It was, it was silent. That was kind of funny. But really, that's what we're supposed to do, right? We don't have to sell everything that we own. We don't have to be Mother Teresa because not all of us are called to do that. Only so many people can give up all of their possessions. But the thing that we have to watch 
And the things that we have to understand is that God has to come first in our lives. And if that means in our hometown or in our families that we're shunned, then that's what it meant when Jesus said, I've come not to bring peace, but I've come to set father against mother, and mother or father against son, and mother against daughter, and daughter against father, and, and son against mother, and brother against sister. It's about following God and making God first. And knowing that we can go out into the world dependent upon the generosity of others because Christ is going to be in them. And He is going to provide for us day in and day out. I believe it, I've seen it, over and over again. Even in the darkest time, God's always provided. And that's what he's calling us to do. To go out into the world, not to tell people that they have to turn around and do things differently in their lives, but to love them exactly where they are. And not allow things that we think should get in the way to get in the way. Not allow the mindset of Jesus' town to be in our minds meaning that we think we know a person based upon who they were, who they are, or how we judge them by based upon their outward signs of who they say they are, or the way that they look, or the way that they act. Right? People see me out in public when I'm not dressed with this little piece of plastic under my chin and grab their kids and run away from me. <laughs> I'm being honest, they do. Because I don't look like a pastor. We can't judge people by how they look. Because we don't know the inside story on who they actually are. So don't let our preconceived notions get in the way of us actually hearing the grace of God from a different place or in a different way. Be open to how God is moving in the world and be a part of that movement, going out and telling everyone not to repent. Don't tell them to repent, but tell them the story of what God did for you so that they might repent. Because that's what God commissioned the twelve to do, and that's what he commissions each and every one of us to do. To go out into the world, to share that story of love, grace, and hope in a different way, in a way they've never heard, or in the same old-fashioned way that they've always heard it before. But tell them how much you are loved and how much they are loved too. So that. So that. Thank you. So that. Come on, people. I know it's a small crowd this morning, but we're going out to tell the story so that.